Chapter 30 The slammer stood in an obscure place between the homestead and the North Glade Wall, hidden behind thorny, ragged bushes that looked like they hadn't been trimmed in ages. It was a big block of roughly cut concrete with one tiny barred window and a wooden door that was locked from a with a menacing, rusty metal latch like something out of the Dark Ages. Newt took out a key and opened it up, then motioned for Thomas to enter. There's only a chair in there and nothing at all for you to do. Enjoy yourself. Thomas groaned inwardly as he stepped inside and saw the one piece of furniture, an ugly rickety chair with one leg obviously shorter than the rest. Probably on purpose. Didn't even have a cushion. Have fun, Newt said before closing the door. Thomas turned back to his new home and heard the latch close and the lock click behind him. Newt's head appeared at the little glassless window, looking through the bars, a smirk on his face. Nice reward for breaking the rules. You saved some lives, Tommy, but you still need to learn. Yeah, I know. Order. Newt smiled. You're not half bad, Shank. But friends who know, gotta run things properly. Keep us buggers alive. Think about that while you sit here and stare at the bloody walls. And then he was gone. The first hour passed and Thomas felt boredom creep in like rats under the door. By hour number two, he wanted to bang his head against the wall. Two hours after that, he started to think that having dinner, dinner with Galley and the Grievers would beat sitting in the stupid slammer. He sat and tried to bring back memories, but every effort evaporated into obvious mist before anything formed. Thankfully, Chuck had arrived with lunch at noon, relieving Thomas from his thoughts. After passing some pieces of chicken and, gla and a glass of water through the window, he took up his usual role of taking, talking Thomas's ears off. Everything's getting back to normal, the boy announced. The runners are out in the maze. Everyone's working. Maybe we'll survive after all. Still no sign of galley. Newt told the runner to come back lickety-splickety if they found his body. And, oh yeah, Albie's up and around. Seems fine. And Newt's glad... He doesn't have to be the big boss anymore. The mention of Alby pulled something Thomas's attention from his food. He pictured the older boy thrashing around, choking himself the day before. Then he remembered no one else knew what Alby had said after Al Newt left the room before the seizure. But that didn't mean Alby wouldn't keep it between them now that he was up and walking around. Chuck continued talking, taking a completely unexpected turn. Thomas... I'm kind of messed up, man. It's weird to feel sad and homesick, but have no idea what it is you wish you could go back to, you know? All I know is I don't want to be here. I want to go back to my family. Whatever's there, whatever I was taken from, I want to remember. Thomas was a little surprised. He never heard Chuck say something so deep or true. I know what you mean, he murmured. Chuck was too short for his eyes to reach where Thomas could see him, see them as he spoke. But from his next statement, Thomas imagined them filling with a bleak sadness, maybe even tears. I used to cry every night. This made thoughts of Albie leave Thomas's mind. Yeah? Like a pants wetting baby. Almost till the day you got here. Then I just got used to it, I guess. This became home, even though we spend every day hoping to get out. I've only cried once since showing up, but that was after getting eaten, almost getting eaten alive. I'm probably just a sh shallow Chuck face. Thomas might not have admitted it if Chuck hadn't opened up. You cried? He heard Chuck say through the window. Then? Yeah. When the last one finally fell over the cliff, I broke down and sobbed till my throat and chest hurt. Thomas remembered all too well. Everything crushed in on me at once. Sure, sure made me feel better. Didn't feel bad about crying, ever. Kind of does make you feel better, huh? Weird how that works. A few minutes passed in silence. Thomas found himself hoping Chuck wouldn't leave. Hey, Thomas? Chuck asked. Still here. Do you think I have parents? Real parents? Thomas laughed. Mostly to push away the sudden surge of sadness that the statement caused. Of course you do, Shank. You need me to explain the birds and bees? Thomas's heart hurt. He, couldn't, he could remember getting that lecture, but not who had given it to him. That's not what I meant, Chuck said, his voice completely devoid of cheer. It was a low, bleak, almost a mumble. 
most of the guys who've gone through the changing room remember terrible things that they won't even talk about. Which makes me doubt I have anything good back home. So, I mean, do you think it's really possible I have a mom and dad out in the world somewhere missing me? Do you think they cry at night? Thomas was completely shocked to realize his eyes had filled with tears. Life had been so crazy since he had arrived, he never really talked, thought of the other gladers of people with real families and missing them. It was strange. But he hadn't really thought of himself that way. Only about what it all meant, who'd sent them there, and how they'd ever get out. For the first time, he felt something for Chuck that made him angry that he wanted to kill somebody. The boy should be in school, in a home, playing with neighborhood kids. He deserved to go home at night to a family who loved him and worried about him, a mom who would make him take a shower every day and a dad who helped him with homework. Thomas hated the people that, who had taken this poor innocent kid from his family. He hated them with a passion he didn't know a human could feel. He wanted them dead, tortured even. He wanted Chuck to be happy. But happiness had been ripped from their lives. Love had been ripped from their lives. Listen to me, Chuck. Thomas paused, calming down as much as he could, making sure his voice didn't crack. I'm sure you have parents. I know it. Sounds terrible, but I bet your mom is sitting in her room right now, holding your pillow, looking out at the world that stole you from her. And yeah, I bet she's crying. Hard, puffy-eyed, snotty nose crying. The real deal. Chuck didn't say anything, but Thomas thought he heard the slightest of sniffles. Don't give up, Chuck. We're going to solve this thing and get out of here. I'm a runner now. I promise on my life I'll get you back to that room of yours. Make your mom quit crying. And Thomas meant it. He felt it burn in his heart. Hope you're right, Chuck said with a shaky voice. He showed a thumbs up in the window, then walked away. Thomas stood up, stood up to pace a little room, ferning an intense desire to keep his promise. Sorry, fuming with an intense desire to keep his promise. I swear, Chuck. He whispered to no one. I swear, I'll get you back home.